You're listening to Corb Conversations on the Business of Brands with Sudeep Chawla and Sharavana Raghavan. So, Sharan, I have been in marketing teams for quite some time and worked on various brands. Now, I've always wondered that usually, you know, a lot of lot of that brand work happens over a period of months, years, etc. And then, you know, sometimes consultants come in, they are called in to get some brand work done via what they call as brand workshops. And I've always wondered, you know, how somebody can walk in and, you know, get us to do brand work, something that usually otherwise takes months and years in possibly a day or two with at best some post-sheets and some charts at their disposal. I've never dared to ask this to a consultant, but now that I have you on the hot seat today, <laughs> and uh, I know that you've been doing this for some time now. Right. So help me understand this. Possibly a lot of our listeners might also be wondering, why should they even involve a consultant when everything has to be done by the team? Just please <laughs> help shed some light on this. So I usually say the consultant is like personal trainer that you hire. Personal trainer is paid to make you work hard. So that's the role of a consultant usually. But I think it's a fair point. It's a very fair question a lot of people have about what happens in these brand workshops. While while you call them brand workshops, I think we should make a demarcation saying what kinds of brand workshops there are. Okay. Just calling them brand workshops are usually training programs which kind of help marketers brush up on their basics and brush up on their skills as marketers. Because you learn something in school, there are different models evolving, there's technology evolving. So marketers need to stay up to date on the business. So a lot of these brand workshops are meant to brush up these skills. Sometimes you'd see Facebook coming in, running a workshop to say how to leverage Facebook as a marketer. Google does it. There are marketing experts who come in and do brand workshops to do the basics right. So they end up being training programs at at times. And I'm sure that's not the question you're asking. What you're asking about is the brand strategy workshops. And the brand strategy is what takes a longer time to put together. There are different kinds of workshops, different ways to run them. I usually run them over a couple of days only. Okay. And these workshops when I run them, are meant to be decision hotboxes. Okay, that's an interesting word. What is a decision hotbox? They are sessions that compress timelines of hard decisions on a brand and Hmm. force the leadership to make choices based on the various information sources put together. Force the leadership to make choices. Right. So when you explain that a brand strategy takes a long time to put together is because The information flow is slow and steady and the leadership takes decisions as and when necessary or sometimes when it's delayed also. The job of a consultant is is to accelerate this decision-making process by accelerating the inflow of information. Okay, sounds logical. But why only leadership as in isn't the brand co-owned by, you know, a significant part of the marketing team? Beautiful question. Because remember, you spoke about how leadership is convinced by the abstract. And as you go lower down the ranks, you need more tangible evidence to convince people. So it's it's similar to that in the sense that leadership sets the direction. Now, you can't spend two days making decisions with the brand manager only to have a challenge by leadership after those two days are done. Because the information is going to be the same. It's the seniority of the person that determines what decision is being taken. Mm -hmm. So we get the leadership's buy-in first. It's not just one leader. It is a leadership team, usually. It's about four or five people at least. And we instigate debate. In these workshops, what's interesting also is that when everybody agrees too fast on something is when it's actually a red flag. (laughs) That's when our work starts. Because if you agree too fast, it means the point has not been debated enough. Maybe the answer is right. But not all information has been con- given its due diligence. So our job is to create tension in, this, in the room to, to trigger debate and conversation and challenge each other. 
And that happens well among peers and the leadership group as peers are more comfortable challenging each other with just themselves in the room. That is why we focus on the leadership here. Okay, a lot of controversial terms in there. Leadership, debate, challenge. Seems like there's a lot of firefighting to be done after the consultant leaves. Oh, no. So the whole point is that while the entire conversation is pretty charged, by the end of the workshop, the idea Mm. is to have everybody's buy-in. Even if one person is not convinced, Mm. the workshop cannot progress. Mm. As in not agreeing to it, but actually being convinced with the decision. Mm. So if a person isn't convinced, then falls on the consultant to supply the data or the information that helps or refutes their stand. Fair, fair. Okay. Give me some examples. What what are these workshops meant for? What is the objective? It could vary anyway. Mm. As far as brands are concerned, it could be about setting new brand guidelines mm. or refreshing an existing brand itself. Mm. Sometimes there's brand architecture issues. So mm. innovations have come into the mix and they're not necessarily leveraging the mother brand too well or with especially with D2C in the horizon, not in the Mm. horizon, in looming all over us, Mm. go-to-market becomes a top priority. So any of this could be a workshop decision. You could take anything and this is the process we'd follow. Information, challenges, decisions, and therefore an action plan to be executed. Okay. So fair enough. Those sound like valid brand and strategy objectives which the workshops might fulfill. So just why don't you take an example, for example, take new brand guidelines. While I understand what possibly you are aiming for, give us an example. How do you make it effective? So the effectiveness of it comes from getting the rest of the team to buy in. Now, while we have alignment and ownership from within the workshop, it is also the job of the consultant to download it to rest of the team while the leadership makes the decision and we have their buy-in, the rollout of it depends on the rest of the team. And in the entire process, we are mere facilitators. So the decisions are made by the leadership. The information is largely either bought by the company or the firm or it's available freely. We just tabulate it. And once the alignment with the leadership is sorted, They own it and we become their ambassadors going around telling people why they should be doing what they should be doing. And what happens most of the time is that, especially with refreshing brands and brand guidelines, is that the team is so emotionally attached to what they've done in the past, especially if it's a legacy brand. When you go to them, you go to them with a few more tangibles. Maybe your identity is changing. Maybe your brand assets are changing. And people are very emotionally attached to the old ones. Then your story is not just about the decisions that have been taken, but to walk them through what necessitated these decisions and why this route is the best option to go forward. And what benefits we're looking, what results we're looking to achieve by making the changes we're making. And also assuring them that life goes on as normal. So that is what our role is and if we can do this successfully and if the client organization team has bought in to these decisions made in the workshop that itself is proof of effectiveness of a a well done session okay fair enough so tell me you are saying that the legacy information obviously is there with all the participants what they want to get to is also broadly known to them And, you know, they are the ones who are getting there with information sources also. Yeah. And what you are helping them do is arrive at a decision which everybody buys into. Right. Okay, fair enough. And tell me whether, have you had any cases where you, you know, by the end of the workshop, you possibly thought that this is not going well. People haven't bought into what they, what the decision is, you know, seeming like from the leadership point of view. Have you had such an experience? Almost all the workshops go that way. (laughs) But the difference is that doesn't happen at the end of the second day. Mm. End of the first day is when it's usually panic mode. Oh, okay. 
and people are not even looking to kind of look at each other at the end of the day in the end of the first day and this is the reason we do it offsite because everybody got to sit down for dinner <laughs> and that kind of breaks a lot of ice oh lovely that's a good point actually and once you sit down for dinner and the ice is broken casual conversations come in then you actually understand see we don't stop working then right as a consultant you are switched on even during the dinner sessions and you're checking for what is the motivation behind this objection and what you need to assuage to get this decision through and maybe that one person who's not aligned is actually got the right answer and we need to be open to that also so that means you got to find data to either back it up or to refute it you actually spend a lot of the night trying to put this together for for the next day morning mm mm-hmm. so a lot of work happens behind the scenes oh yeah while the participants might only see what is happening in front of them and, and that's the job because they're not supposed to see what's happening behind the scenes and even for a two day workshop a good consultant preps for at least a month because oh okay there's enough information to be gathered most of the time that's field work required you go spend time with the sales teams you go spend time with consumers validate quantitative data with qualitative inputs and the biggest challenge that i encounter me personally is that a lot of brand owners romanticize anecdotes yeah yeah the challenge is to differentiate anecdotes from the norm and anecdotes are lovely to listen to but they are merely anecdotes they don't make up for most of the norm differentiating that becomes the challenge interesting okay fair so now sharan there are a lot of you know most of our listeners would have one or the other brand tasks at their end as marketers as brand owners as business owners we are working continuously on our brands i am sure it would come to their head frankly i am also thinking in that sense when should i be involving a consultant for any of the brand work that i'm doing i can't be involving a consultant for stuff that i'm doing on a day to day basis and every major decision also can't be with the involvement of a consultant so when should a marketing team think about involving somebody like a consultant or somebody from outside to facilitate the decision oh that's a good question because i have never gotten a brief to say this is what i want to do my the best briefs i've gotten are a business problem of a uh, brief saying we've launched three innovations in the last 6 months our business continues to plateau and there's increased cannibalization we've had competition from a certain segment which we were no, which we did not anticipate and we are losing business so it's more comes in as a business problem and then it is for us to sit down and figure if it's actually a brand problem or not or if brand can be a solution to that business problem and that is when we start defining saying do we need a new brand i remember we did a recent case study of james versus skin to joy so that is a kind of problem that comes up saying do we need to launch a new brand do we have a existing brand in the stable what are the competition's weaknesses is that the real competition to we should be worried about does the competition have steam do we have a right to win and what are the issues so framing the problem becomes the first challenge okay once the problem is framed then you realize what information you need then you either buy or research or check for the data that's available then once you have the hard data the numbers the quant quants available with you then you go in and validate this quant with qualitative information then you put together the proper narrative for the brand situation and then come up with options so this is an interesting part of workshops so there are different kinds of clients right some clients say tell me what i should be doing some tell me 
give me options what are my options here some are like i have no clue tell me so we got to be ready for all of that so we got to have ready options to give and repercussions for each option what will it take how long will it take what is your confidence level for businesses that say tell me what i should do then we go in and say this is the ideal solution because the other solutions confidence level is slightly lower or higher or or it's expensive or it's too late you need some early action so stuff like that so that's usually the flow of uh, decisions you're listening to cog conversations on the business of brands your hosts are sudeep chawla marketing practitioner business leader and educator to advertising and marketing professionals and sharavana raghavan of vitral brand expertise growth consultants to consumer facing brands and businesses for more information go to cobcast.net if you find this podcast helpful please help us by telling your friends and rating us okay and if any brand owner startup owner etc has got a problem that they are not able to figure out any solution to that is when you're saying they should go and possibly seek external help see no entrepreneur will say i'm not able to figure out a solution to this it's in, in the entrepreneur's dna to find one solution or the other but where you need to find the difference is when you know what your core strengths are and what you can immediately action on your own for example this client i spoke about had launched three innovation in the last 6 months because the business had plateaued and after that also the business was plateaued so that's when he reached out to consultants but any business issue that you think my operations are going well but my results are not matching my operations getting in external help having the external perspective consultants are not brought in because they know better it's not because they are wiser or they provide solutions out of the blue they can do that with in certain organizations but a lot of the time it's about bandwidth management what would take the company 6 to 8 months in fact this is the question you started with can be accelerated by bringing on a consultant to capture the information verify it and bring you to a point of decision making in a matter of weeks that is where a consultant comes in that's why we put it higher consultants to accelerate the entire process okay now in fact i i hear two strands one is i think this is a lovely point to say that a consultant helps you accelerate the uh, problem solution because then he is the one he or she is the one who is zoning into the problem while you are while you have your other routines to handle yeah the second thing like you said that it's not about that they know better it's just that one they focus on the problem and number two they might provide some fresh perspective absolutely yeah because you are too zoomed in or you are too close to the problem sometimes you need a little bit of fresh perspective and that much amount of focus and probably the problems might start resolving themselves absolutely the point is i can't do it for my own business in fact i reach out to fellow consultants to come and take a look at my business because when you're too close to the problem it's very difficult to get a larger perspective and that's primarily the reason people exist as consultants fair and any anecdote any interesting story you want to share with our listeners about any from any of your workshops i'm not sure if it's been interesting but something that kind of satisfied me as a brand consultant was was one where uh, this entrepreneur was super charged and he's like he was so clear what he wanted to launch and i said so why do you why do you need need a help he said i don't know marketing so i need you to help me do build the brand but he was like i know what exactly i want 
I said, then, then why do you need a consultant? You can go directly to an agency. I said, no, no, no. I don't know the language. I need to help you. Help me with the language. So I said, okay, I'll ask you a few questions. And based on that, we'll decide whether you need me at all or not. And this was a bicycle brand. And he was so kicked. Uh, he is an Indian from Germany. And he wanted to launch the best looking bicycle in India. And I was like, how good can a bike look here? It doesn't matter. It's bike doesn't have to look very good. It's a bar. What? How better can it look? Yeah, you can have different tires and all. I really couldn't understand the nuance where he was going. And the more I spoke, he was so passionate about the topic. He was articulating the good-looking bike, the good-looking features of the bike is what he was talking about. But somehow I didn't get it. He said, no, you're not a cyclist, so you don't get it. That That's why. I said, that's probably exactly why I need to get it. Because I don't understand the category. You need to explain to me why it is important. So we kept pushing, pushing, pushing. Then we realized he's bringing the latest of biking technology to India. But he wasn't talking about it at all. And he said, no, no, people don't understand this. Like, okay, then why are you bringing it? No, but it's very important for Indian roads. Okay, so tell me more. And he said, this helps avoid accidents. There are so many people dying because these the bikes that are currently sold in India are not great. And that is when I got interested. So he was actually bringing a bike that's suitable for Indian riding conditions. And uh, then he went into the full concept of, I, it's public news now, that it's a concept of a gravel bike. So he launched India's first gravel bike. The bike that can go on a on graveled yeah, surface. So okay. The difference is that most bikes in India that are sold the base level are hybrid bikes. And basically there are road bikes and mountain bikes. Mountain bikes give you great control. They're primarily for off-roading. And road bikes offer speed. And when people start biking in India... They start with a hybrid bike. You go to Decathlon, pick up a bike for 20, 30,000. 95% chance it's a hybrid bike. And people think it's give, it gives you control and speed, but apparently it doesn't give you either. It neither gives you control nor speed. It just gets you to move. It doesn't, it's, doesn't, it's not contoured for your body. It's not very great for you and all that. And, but nobody wants to invest more than 20, 30,000 when you start. But when you are comfortable and you want to upgrade, mountain bikes as a premium segment does not exist in India. Off-roading is not a big culture. It's all imported. What's available are the road bikes. So people you see in the morning riding are largely the road bike guys. So that, and he said, these guys have so many accidents every year and he had some statistics. Like, why didn't you tell me this before? No, no, people don't understand this. I'm like, that's the whole job of the brand to get people to understand this. Or talk to people who already understand this. So, then he explained that this new technology called gravel bike is fit for Indian roads. Where even if it's gravels loose and all, because the road bikes do not give you so much control on, on Indian roads. Where you don't have exclusive lanes, there's traffic going everywhere, you've got potholes. And they can be dangerous. The gravel bike actually combats that. And his theory was that India is about 20 years behind US in biking technology. And US is 10 years behind Europe in biking technology. So basically, Germany is 30 years ahead of India in biking technology. And in India, bicycles have always been seen as a poor man's commute. While it's one of the biggest markets in India. It's never really been the, at the forefront of innovation. It's become a lifestyle product in the last few years. But most of the innovations available here are the outdated ones. And if you need the latest of innovation, you've got to shell out something like 12 to 15 lakh rupees. So you don't get the latest innovation otherwise. 
So he was going to bring the latest of innovation to India and introduce this gravel bike. So in Europe, they're calling gravel biking as the SUV of biking. As in, that's a trend they're expecting to last a few decades. And he was to be, I mean, he is now the pioneer of gravel biking in India. And he said gravel bikes need to look good. And he had invested a lot in the painting technology. And that is why he was saying, I'll make the best looking bike in India. So, and we went and spoke to cyclists, cycling clubs. And then we understood that they are waiting for this technology. And these are not starters. These are people who are aware, they're part of biking clubs and all. And they know of the technology, but they don't have access to it. So then we had to reframe the entire target audience for him, saying it's not, his, his initial point was, anybody who starts biking in India should buy my bike. Then we said it's not for anybody who starts biking. It will either be the second upgrade or the third upgrade for a biker. So they should have been biking for at least two years before they understand their own biking style to know what to ask for. And then we did the entire brand strategy and go to market for him. And he was so happy that all of it came together the way he in, I had it in his mind, but was struggling to articulate what he actually needed. So that was a very interesting experience in a category that I previously had zero experience in. We managed to change the perspective of the entrepreneur and help him articulate what he wanted. And most workshops happen this way. But this one was quite stark because it's a category I'd never even looked at with my left eye before. Really interesting. So I think uh, one possible advantage of being in this job is that you get to dip your toes into quite a few categories that you otherwise might not have thought or heard or at least, you know, worked on. Oh, absolutely. Because, see, as a consultant, I don't have to challenge the client on, on the industry knowledge. We're not there to compete. So the, the client brings the industry knowledge. We carry the brand tools with us. And we, at the less we know about the category beforehand, I've realized it's better because you can ask the most stupidest of questions and therefore find some answers which people take for granted. Correct. Correct. And knowing you, Sharon, I think it is for the client's uh, betterment also if you don't know the category. Otherwise, he will be subjected to too many sarcastic remarks. Not knowing the category doesn't stop me from making sarcastic remarks. <laughs> <laughs> but I hold back until my advance is received. After that, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. I think, I think it's quite interesting. And I also learned quite a bit from the chat today, Sharon. And in fact, uh, some of my key takeaways are about the fact that there are various types of brand workshops. I didn't know that. Uh, I'd already, uh, I'd always approached it as one. And then within that workshop, your key point was that you are there as a facilitator. You help accelerate decision making. You help align decisions amongst the right stakeholders so that the execution can happen seamlessly afterwards. And sometimes you provide the external perspective also. Yeah. And hence, all the startup founders or business owners who are listening to us should consider hiring a consultant when usually you want a problem to be solved at war footing and while your routine keeps running and you don't want to pull out all the resources or when you want somebody to look at the problem from a very different, very external perspective. Yeah. Okay, excellent. So I think this this was a great one, uh, Sharon. Thank you for letting us have a sneak peek into a consultant's routine, their method of working, ways of working, etc. Really fun. Good fun. Thank you. Thank you, Sudeep. Thank you for listening to Cobb Conversations on the Business of Brands with Sudeep Chawla and Sharavana Raghavan. Subscribe and learn more at corpcast.net. That's C-O-B-B-C-A-S-T dot net.